Narcissist Ensnared, Episode 19. The following day, Ian Wynne and Ashley had headed out with Christopher to the market town of Pelloncroft and visited the abbey there. They had walked around it as Wynne talked about the history of the place and Ashley looked at him in an admiring fashion. She kept commenting that she could never do this with Peter because he had no interest in history and would not tolerate her liking it. Wynne was now well used to hearing her denigrating Peter, but he never discouraged it. The more that she did so, the greater the gulf that opened up between the two of them, and the more secure Wynne began to feel. The two of them pushed Christopher around in his buggy as if they were a married couple, and Wynne took various photos of Ashley with her son. Once they had finished at the Abbey and looking around the nearby market, they made their way to a splendid pub where they celebrated Ashley's imminent start at Combank. Whilst the two of them were sipping champagne and toasting her new future, Peter was boxing up twenty years of his relationship with Ashley. "'Here's to your new start at Combank,' toasted Wynne. "'Thank you,' said Ashley. She looked around the pub, which was half full. "'I never imagined that I would be sat here with you, away from him and with a new job. How things change,' she added. "'Absolutely. It's all to the good. "'You haven't forgotten I have that meeting with Paul tomorrow "'to go through my maintenance submissions "'and his response to my letter requesting he leave me alone?' "'No, it's at four o'clock, isn't it?' "'Yes, I've arranged for my parents to look after the children tomorrow night "'so I can come and stay with you at yours. "'I will feel happier being there. "'He doesn't know where you live. "'That would be great. "'I thought we might have a bit of a party.' just me and you, you know, to say goodbye to Novo Bank and to celebrate my arrival at Combank. I will cook us something if you buy the champagne. I'd be delighted to. Good. I'll give you a list of ingredients to get. You can go and get them after the meeting with Paul while I sort out the children. Sure. I also thought we might get something extra special, seeing as we have such a good thing to celebrate, she added. What did you have in mind? Well, you know people, don't you? You know, those kind of people who you can get it from. Get what? asked Wynne. Ashley lowered her voice and leant in towards Wynne. Some cocaine? Yes, I do. Could you get some for tomorrow night? I've always wanted to try it. I could do. You've never tried it before? No. Peter always wanted to, but he kept bottling going and getting some. I'd love to try it. I hear that making love whilst on it's amazing. Wynne recalled the few times that he had done so in the past, but declined to mention it. OK, if you want, I'll sort some out. Brilliant, I can't wait. You'll have to guide me through how to use it, though. I don't know what to do. Come on, you must have an idea, said Wynne. No, seriously, it's not the kind of thing that I've grown up with. Well, neither have I. My parents would kill me if they knew that I did this. But I still know what to do. Yes, that's because you've done it before. Loads of your mates do it. Not that much, said Wynne, playing it down. He infrequently used it, mainly with certain friends, and only when he knew he would sleep the next day. He liked to think that he had a decent amount of willpower when it came to dealing with the white powder. He had certainly seen some of his colleagues develop serious habits, and he was not going down that road. But you can get some, pressed Ashley. Oh yes, good, do it. The following evening, after a constructive, if fiery, meeting with Paul Harrison, Ashley arrived at Wynne's house. He was upstairs in his bedroom, having just got changed, when she let herself in and bounded up the stairs. She greeted him with a long kiss and then looked around the room. "'Where is it?' she asked. Wynne laughed. "'Don't you want to have dinner first? All the ingredients are downstairs.' "'We can do that later. I want some.' You won't want to eat anything after you've taken it, commented Wynne. That's good. I need to lose some weight. <laughs> like fuck you do, said Wynne, as he slipped his hands around her waist as if to accentuate the point. Come on, don't keep me waiting, she said, and appeared agitated. Okay. Wynne opened a drawer 
in the chest of drawers on which a large television was positioned. The drawer was empty, apart from a mirror on which several white lines of cocaine had been drawn up. Carefully, he lifted the mirror out and placed it on top of the drawers. He reached into his wallet and selected a fifty-pound note. Always works better with a fifty, he remarked, as he rolled it into a funnel. What do I do? asked, Wishley, asked Ashley, as Wynne handed her the rolled note. Snort it. Up my nose. Yes. She positioned the note into her nose and hovered over the nearest line, which was more of a poodle's leg than a slender line. Um, that one's mine. You might want the next one in, which is smaller. Cautioned Win. Ashley ignored him and hoovered up the larger line of cocaine in one fluid moment. She stood up and removed the note. She appeared to be reflecting on its effect. Mm, you dealt with that like a professional would. Are you sure you've never taken it before? asked Wynne. Never. Blimey. I don't feel anything. I'd better have some more, she said, and leaned into the next line. Whoa, said Wynne, and he put his hand in front of her, causing her to move back. What is it? she asked. <laughs> Steady on. That's strong stuff. I can handle it. Remember, shake me and I rattle. I'm usually full of pills as it is. Um, all the more reason to be cautious with this, said Wynne, as he ushered her away and snorted a line himself. Come on, let me have some more, she urged. Listen, you'll lose track of time and snort more than you should. I always make a note of when I've had a line and then wait thirty minutes before the next one. That way it lasts, and also you don't go overboard with it. Yes, Dad, she joked. I mean it. Just be guided by me with this. If you say so. Well, if you're going to be mean and not let me have any for thirty minutes, you can fuck me instead. Where's the champagne? Here. Wynne reached behind her and handed her a flute of champagne, which she downed in one go. This is going to be a great night, she declared, and reached to the bottle chilling in a bucket of ice to refill her glass. It was 7am, and Wynne watched as Ashley drove away up the road. He felt drained, and reached for a bottle of water chugging down its contents. He'd only been asleep for two hours, and it wasn't really a quality sleep. He suspected Ashley hadn't even slept at all. They'd got through four grams, and it was of decent quality too. For someone who had apparently never taken it before, she was certainly able to demolish it. Five bottles of champagne lay empty, placed on the drawers. They had demolished the first two grams that he had purchased just before midnight, and she made him ring out for more. As always, she offered no contribution towards the purchase, but had stood at the top of the stairs, eagerly awaiting his return with the two bags of powder. In between, they had fucked one another as she talked incessantly. Wynne found that the powder gave him superhuman drinking abilities, and he remained alert. But he never suffered from the verbal diarrhoea that it often seemed to cause in others, often women that he'd noted. By the time that she had ingested half a gram, Ashley was motoring away, talking at a hundred miles an hour. She would find a song on YouTube and start playing, then switch to another, take a drink of champagne, kiss Wynne, and then continue talking. Wynne just drank his champagne, snorted his line, and then made a note of the time to show Ashley it was too early for her to have more. She soon lost track of time, demanding another line, just a couple of minutes after having had one. She seemed to win, as if she was going to explode, as she danced naked about the room. She pulled on the football shirt that he had bought her for her thirtieth birthday, and then found the shorts that went with it in Wynne's drawer. She had posed and strutted, waltzing around, asking Wynne to take various pictures of her. She lifted the top, and had him take pictures of her naked breasts before dropping the pants and turning, pushing her bottom towards the telephone as he snapped away. Then she removed the kit and climbed on Wynne, massaging him, and then riding him. All the while she talked. She talked about winning races at school, how she first got in at Combank and her successes there, how Amelia was clever and Christopher was too because they got it from her. She talked about how Amelia was good at sport and her recitals because Ashley was. She talked about how her car was the best in its class, moved on to clothes and how her purchases were superior. Houses came next and then jewellery. From topic to topic she raced, always extolling how she was the best and how she had to have the best. Wynne commented occasionally 
but she was not listening to him. You see, the thing is, nobody understands me. I'm head and shoulders above them. They don't like it, but they have to understand it. That was Peter's problem. He was jealous of me. Always wanted to cut me down when I was saying something. He always knew better. That was just his way of trying to brush over the fact that I was and I'm better than him. I'm better than those fools at Novobank. Who do they think they are, trying to push me out? Ha! I showed them. I've gone now, and it's their loss. I will bring that bank down. I will. I will not rest until they are picking amongst the debris after I've brought it crashing down around them. I don't need anybody. I am Ashley Havenia, and I do what I want. Nobody can stop me. I am everything, and I am everywhere. You know, I sometimes stand in front of the mirror and then realise an hour has passed by, as I admire what I can see before me. More people need to see that. On and on, she continued, surpassing the length of Hamlet's soliloquy. Wynne just listened, amused. He knew what cocaine did to people, and he toyed with filming her so she could watch how grandiose she had behaved, but ultimately he thought that was a mean thing to do and decided against it. The night raced by as they snorted, drank, and buried themselves in one another. Eventually, the supply of cocaine was exhausted, and Ashley begged him to ring out for more. She would not let up, and he had to pretend that he had tried, but the dealer wasn't answering. But it's 4am. These are his peak hours, protested Ashley. How would you know that? asked Wynne. Anyway, he'll be tucked up in bed. Pleased with how much he's sold, replied Wynne. Eventually, he managed to dissuade her from wanting any more, and they lounged down to try to sleep. He tossed and turned, and just as he felt like he was drifting into a heavy period of sleep, he was aware that Ashley was getting dressed. What are you doing? Getting dressed. I need to be back for the children. Ashley, you can't possibly drive. You're way over the limit and probably still high. I'm fine. I need to be back. I don't want him driving past and seeing my car isn't there. He'll only cause trouble. Wynne let out a sign of exasperation. At least take a taxi then if you need to go, he urged. No, it's fine, honestly. They won't be up yet. And your parents have them. At least have some sleep. No, I have to go. I'll text you later. Wynne gave in. She was determined to go. He heard her close the front door and watched her cross the road to her car. He was not at all pleased, as... He felt that she was in no fit state to drive, but she really did not seem to care. He was too tired now to try and argue with her, and he drank the entire bottle of water before falling into bed. He reached for his phone, set the alarm and made sure it on silent. He was going back to sleep. Wynne rose at 1pm. He had slept soundly, and once he had showered, he felt fine. He would only ever do this, knowing that he had no work the next day. He had seen the effect that it had on people who had been up all night and then came to work. He was not so stupid, or as uncaring, to take such steps. He always found that if he drank plenty of water and had a good stint of uninterrupted sleep, the excess of the night before wouldn't really take its toll on him. He checked his phone, but there was no call or message from Ashley. He was pleased as he would not have wanted to miss her trying to get in touch with him. He began dressing as he was taking his nephews to the football match and needed to get a move on. He would collect them by taxi just to be on the safe side and he knew that he would fancy a drink at half-time anyway. He need not have worried about not hearing from Ashley as a couple of hours later, whilst he was trying to watch the football match, she bombarded him with messages. He didn't reply. He was watching the game with a friend and also talking to his nephews. She knew he was at the game, so would surely understand. There was a bombardment of messages, all with the usual three kisses at the end. I'm finding it very enjoyable removing his clothes. I like all this space I am created. I've put his clothes in the luggage set, so can we buy a new set just for us? There is lots of room in the wardrobes and drawers for you now. I think I would like you to live here now he is going. It is as if I am exorcising him from my life. We are going to be okay, aren't we? I chose most of these clothes for him, although he didn't care. I should give them away, actually. I know you are watching the football, 
but I like to keep a connection with you. I am excited now I feel I am getting somewhere. Where are you? Why aren't you answering me? I miss you. Please answer. Why won't you reply? Who are you with? Where are you? Please answer me. Answer me. Are you with some slut? Who is she? Where the fuck are you? Wynne counted nearly fifty messages in all, like a stream of consciousness from her. He shook his head at the increasing aggressiveness and questioning nature of the text. She knew where he was. He toyed with calling her, but decided that he wouldn't. Instead, he sent a text. I am at the football, as I told you. I'll speak to you later. Kiss, kiss, kiss. There was no reply. He wasn't bothered, as he wanted to enjoy his time with his nephews, and the game was an absorbing one. And besides, he had pl spent plenty of time with Ashley in the course of the week. After dropping his nephews off, he tried ringing Ashley, but she didn't answer. He reasoned she was busy with the children, and left a pleasant message for her before settling back in the taxi to head to his own house. Just as he pulled up beside his house, his phone rang. Hello, he greeted Ashley. I bet you're tired, he remarked as he gave the driver a note and waved at him to keep the change. He climbed out of the, bank of the back of the taxi. Oh, I'm fine. I'm used to having next to no sleep. I was worried this afternoon. Why? You didn't reply and didn't ring me. Well, I kept thinking you might be going to sleep, so that's why I didn't ring. I didn't want to interrupt you. That and the fact I wouldn't have been able to hear you above the noise of the crowd at the match. You could have replied to my text messages, though. I was busy with my nephews. Besides, it wasn't ur urgent, was it? It's important to stay in touch, though. Why? asked Wynne as he entered his house. Well, I need you. Yes, but nothing was happening this afternoon, was it? That's not the point. I need you to be there for me. If you are not going to be there for me, then there is no point in doing this, she said as her voice began to rise. Hang on. I'm always here for you. You know that. There was no emergency, so let's just keep a sense of perspective. Yes. Oh, so now you're saying I'm making a song and dance. No, not at all. Well, that is what it sounds like to me. No, you're overreacting. I'm overreacting. You're not the one going through her ex-husband's clothes, clothes which I bought and picked out for him and having to put them in suitcases for him. No, I'm not. And you don't have to do it either. He should be doing it. I want every trace of him removed from this house. He doesn't exist to me. Well, if that helps you deal with getting over his abuse, then that's a good way of doing it, complimented Wynne. Yes, it is. I thought so, too. I think I did too much. Too much? You know what? Last night. Oh, I see. Well, you certainly got stuck in. When can we do it again? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a little while yet. You need to be at your best and not tired. Oh, don't worry about me. I love it. I haven't felt like eating all day. Well, that's no good, Ashley. You need to eat. I'll have something later. Make sure you do, please. I will. What are you doing tonight? I'm going to watch a couple of films with my friends. A few gentle beers. Nothing too wild after last night. Yes, it was good. I want to do it again. Do you think you could send some to my house? Seriously? Yes, I mean, I haven't got the money, but you could pay whoever it is and send them to me. Um, I'm not sure they'll go all that way out of the city, to be fair. Well, give them something extra for petrol. You want me to organise some now? Yes, I feel a little tired and it'll help me get through until bedtime. Please do it for me. I'm not sure. Well, give me the number then and I'll ask, but you'll need to pay for it. He won't answer you. He won't recognise the number. Oh, I see. Well, you do it then, please. I'll try. Give me a minute. Great, thanks. Wynne ended the call. He put the phone down and poured himself a glass of sparkling mineral water. There was no way he was sending drugs to her house. And, moreover, he wasn't going to pay for them. Lord knows what she would end up doing, given how it had affected her last night. And, moreover, she had clearly been awake for over 24 hours now. He gave it a few minutes, pretending as if he had contacted the individual, and then sent her a text. No joy. Kiss, kiss, kiss. His phone rang. Why not? she demanded. 
He's going out tonight and can't travel down to you, lied Wynne. You could get some from him and then drop it off for me. I can't. I haven't got the time, Ashley. You said you'd always make time for me. Ashley, by the time he arrives, and he's never dead on time, it could be an hour away. Then it's an hour round trip for me to drive to yours. Look, leave it now, and we'll do it some other time, okay? She said nothing. Wynne waited. I want some now. Can't do it. You can, you just won't. Do it for me. No. Why not? I've told you why. Come on, I want some. You said you'd do anything for me. I want it. I need it. Please, Ian. Just sort some out for me. You have the time. I'll make it worth your while. Wynne looked at the clock. No, I'm expecting people soon. Ring them and delay them. I'm not doing that. Why not? Are they more important than me? No, of course, but it's not a case of that. What is it, then? I don't want to be rude to them. I haven't got the time, and to be blunt, you don't need a second night on the toot, believe me. Now you sound like him, telling me what is good and what is not good for me. No, I'm just offering my opinion. Well, I don't want your opinion. Are you going to get some gear for me? No. Goodbye. The call ended. Wynne knew he could have pushed his friends back, and also driven down to Ashley, but he didn't want to, and he didn't want her taking more drugs. They seemed to have an appreciably accelerated effect on her, and how someone so slender as her managed to consume as much of the cocaine and champagne as she had, well, it would have defied belief if he had not seen it himself. He then felt the nervous anxiety rising, which always happened when Ashley shouted or ended a call abruptly. He looked at the clock again. Perhaps then he could collect the gear and surprise her by turning up with it. That, of course, would please her mightily. <laughs> 